Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. We finally got all of the results from the different scans and tests, which means we have a lot of answers. We have a lot of questions. We did get a second opinion, but most importantly, we have a little bit of a plan for now. Now, real quick, I know that most of you know who Kendall is, but I do a terrible job of introducing myself. And I know that most of you probably have no idea what my name actually is other than Kendall's dad. Um, my name is Beav, and if you've been watching for a little while, you've likely come across my wife, Brandy, even though she just absolutely hates being on camera. You've probably seen Cameron, our 12-year-old, and Hannah, our two-year-old. So hey, how you doing? Nice to officially meet you. Okay, so first things first, let's go over a few of these easy things. Uh, some of the scans and tests that show how chemo has affected her body uh, and some of her other organs and stuff. So the heart test, the EKG and the echo both came back as like normal function. Her heart's doing great. No concerns there. The hearing test. She does have a little bit of high, like really high frequency hearing loss, uh, but it's like outside of the range of normal sounds on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not really concerned about that. However, we do wonder if it would be worse if Brandy didn't discover the drug uh, called Pedmark. Um, which they give her before the chemo drug uh, cisplatin. And we've, it, it was in another video, and I'll put a link to it down in the description below, but we discovered this uh, drug that would help prevent, could help prevent hearing loss with that particular chemo, and they let us use it. So we wonder now, if we didn't use that, well, would her hearing loss be worse? Like, who knows, but... She's doing great. Now, the renal scan for her kidney function, that test came back and showed that it was like average. It wasn't uh, perfect or like, you know, extraordinary or anything, but it was like average and you know, it could be better. I don't know if it can get better, but we certainly don't want it to get worse because she just has that one remaining kidney left. So we do a lot to try to protect it. We do our best to keep her from becoming dehydrated uh, we make sure that she's getting particular kidney blocking uh, medications before CT scans and things like that. Anything that could be harsh on her kidney, we do our best to uh, alleviate that or protect her kidney against it or whatever. So anyways, all in all, she's doing great there and we're pretty happy about that. There she is. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Hi, Kendall. Good morning. How's it going? Good. Good. I wanted to make sure people got to see your pretty smile first thing this morning. <laughs> they love them some Kendall. <laughs> Doing really good. You feel good? Yeah. You have been running around like a little maniac. But that's cool. Hi. What are you doing, little maniac number two? I'm having a sleepover tonight. You're having a sleepover tonight? Yeah. You excited for that? Yeah. Who's coming over? Everly and Cora. All right. Slumber party. What are we going to do? Pillow fights, maybe. Pillow fights? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to win. No, I am. Mm -mm. No. Okay, someone will jump on your back and I hit you in the head. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you're going to get someone to jump on my back and distract me? Yeah. And then you're just going to hit me in the head with a pillow? Yeah. <laughs> Well, at least you I, have some it, tactics it, it and strategy. It won't hurt because, I mean, it's a pillow. Well, I hope it doesn't hurt. I don't think it will. What are you up to? No good? Hmm? Are we going to go to the pool today? Yeah. With your friends? Or before they get here? I don't know. Oh, can we see your scar? How are you healing up? Let's check out. Let's check out the scar. You can barely see it. Yeah, it's doing good. So the last surgery she had, they cut vertically. They went around her. You can't see it. They got too many tubes in the way. We'll have to check it I don't out. Like where, why they in did that? Bit. Because oh, my pants always rub on the scar. I know. But you're looking really good. You're healing up wonderfully. <laughs>
this is where things get a little bit complicated. She also had the MIBG scan, which is the neuroblastoma scan, a CT scan, a PET scan, and an MRI, all to help us understand how much disease she has left in her body. And there's some good news, there's some bad news, and there's like a whole bunch of questions and decisions to make. Now these most recent set of scans show that there is slightly less uh, active disease in her body, which we kind of expected that to be the answer after, especially after she had that most recent surgery to get the lymph nodes removed, but she hadn't had any other particular treatments that we would expect there to be less um, active disease than the prior set of scans. But the lymph nodes that are causing the obstruction in her gut are still a problem, which means she still can't eat and she's on the feeding pump for like 20 to 24 hours a day, but she's really good and she doesn't feel hungry. She's gaining weight. She can drink clear liquids to sort of satisfy any cravings or get uh, some taste in her mouth and that sort of thing. But we also are draining her stomach from the G-tube. If you remember, she's got this G-J tube. The J-tube is feeding her past her stomach and past the obstruction and then the J-tube I'm sorry, the G-tube goes directly to her stomach, so we're able to use that to drain any contents because your stomach is producing fluids and stuff all the time, plus whatever she drinks. So we have to drain that out, otherwise her stomach will fill up and she'll just throw it all up. Of course, she'd rather not be on it and be eating regular food, but again, she's doing really well and we're super thankful to even have the feeding pump as an option. Now, the biopsy they did of those nodes that are causing that problem showed that they were mostly differentiated or mostly dead, which is great, but it also sort of raises the questions of like, what's gonna happen with those nodes from, from this point forward? Will, will they shrink on their own? Will they need to be removed? Can they be removed? Which, you know, we already had our surgeon said he was not able to do that, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but generally speaking, the answer seems to be like, we just kind of have to wait and see. I, they say that that those nodes could potentially shrink on their own. And again, if she gains weight and has some extra fat padding inside of there, that this obstruction could clear itself up. But again, it's just like a, a hurry up and wait game as far as that goes. Now this is where things start to get like funky. Okay, so try to follow along. Since the beginning of all of this, there has been some level of question about whether or not the liver was involved. And initially the tumor was so big and it was so pushed up against her liver, they couldn't really determine whether or not it had any sort of cancer involvement. As the tumor shrunk and just before they removed it and they did the set of scans, they did see a couple of spots on the liver and they told us, hey, listen, you know, this really isn't anything to be worried about. Uh, there's really, you know, like these kinds of things uh, show up. It's probably benign. We're not going to pay much attention to this. We're going to continue on this path of just treating this um, the way we would treat it anyways. And let's keep just kind of keep an eye on it. Now, this recent set of scans show that those spots on the liver have shrunk, meaning that they have responded to those last two cycles of chemo and immunotherapy. Uh, before that, they were telling us that they were stable, there was no change, which is why they thought they were benign, but now they're showing that they've responded. So like actually, those were metastasized, those were, were small tumors, and they have responded and shrunk, which means, one, that's cancerous, and two, uh, that would have made her a stage four neuroblastoma high risk uh, diagnosis rather than stage two. Um, and that was a hard pill to swallow, even though it doesn't really change a whole lot, um, I don't think, in the way she has been treated up to this point. But it was still kind of a hard pill to swallow, so it like, really took me a minute to, to digest that one. So cute. What's up, ladies? How's it going? This is Kendall's friend, Cora. She's the one that's always playing on the iPad when we're at the hospital. Thank you for keeping Kendall occupied. And Emmy, yes, that's right. You know, that's probably one of her favorite things to do is to play with you guys while she's in the hospital because it makes her happy. And so thank you very much for doing that. That means a lot to us. All right. 
You having some fun in the pool today? Yeah. All right. Poor Hannah, <laughs> what are you doing, little baby? Now, I think we've talked about this before, about Kendall's ability to go swimming and that sort of thing. We were super concerned when we first had to have the Broviac put in, which is the two permanent, semi-permanent, uh, central lines that uh, are sticking out of her chest. And they have that dressing over them. They said, you know, she can't swim, she can't get it wet, that sort of thing. Now, she just can't get her chest wet. So she can still play in the pool, she can get up to her waist, as long as she's not getting her chest wet. And we, you know, wrap her up with uh, some plastic, some, what is it called, press and seal? Press and seal. It's like a saran wrap, and then we tape it on there and make sure it's nice and, and watertight to the best of our ability. And then she can play in the pool with the other kids. She just can't go in the deep end. Right, Kendall? Right. Looking like a million bucks over there. Come here, let me see that pretty smile. And your beautiful hair and this new hat that your friend gave you. Yeah. I love that hat. Hey, Cora, yeah. where's my hat? Huh? I didn't get a NASA hat. <laughs> What's up with that? Uh, no. Rude. <laughs> <It's not her>. <laughs> <laughs> so after all the scans and tests and results came back and all that kind of stuff. The hospital still wants to move forward with doing the transplant. And this it just doesn't sit well with me and Brandy. Like we just don't feel like that's the right next step. Knowing that there's still disease, active disease, and it's responding to other treatments, we feel that like something just it just doesn't sit well with us, you know? And our understanding with that treatment is that it's not really used to, to treat a disease like frontline chemo is. It's more used once they're in remission to prevent it from coming back. Stem cell transplant, the way it's, it, it works is that it's ultra high doses of chemotherapy that just kill off everything. I mean, it kills everything in your body and then they reinfuse your stem cells. The, you know, they collected stem cells way back when, uh, very early on in this process, to give her back. You know, during this treatment, and that starts to rebuild your immune system from scratch. I mean, from zero. All her baby shots, all the anything that she's ever gotten, any immunity, natural immunity she's built to colds and things from daycare or school or whatever, all wiped out. You're starting from zero. They call it your second birthday, and it's. It's, it's a high risk, high risk treatment with a lot of long-term potential side effects. So you can imagine that we're feeling a little bit reluctant to just sort of jump in without maybe looking at alternatives. So we reached back out to Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City and we talked to them very early on in Kendall's diagnosis. I think it was in January. She was diagnosed in December. We talked to Sloan in January, I believe. Maybe it was even December. And um, his take on her current situation after reviewing all the scans and all that kind of stuff, he said he would not do transplant yet. In fact, MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, they don't even do transplants to treat this particular cancer. Uh, and what he told me early on was that she doesn't need to do it and it's not worth exposing her to the toxic levels of the Holtra high doses of chemotherapy, and that statistically the outcome difference isn't any different whether she does a stem cell transplant or doesn't do a stem cell transplant. They have a whole other thing of, you know, that they go down uh, in order to treat it. But he said removing the fact that they don't do stem cell transplants for this cancer, uh, that she still has too much uh, disease burden to consider transplant because again it's like our understanding of how it's designed to be used uh, isn't in this way. So he said you need to address that liver and those lymph nodes before you even consider the transplant versus no transplant debate. He also told me back in like January or whenever it was that I spoke to him the first time that we should consider coming up there for the surgery. He said, you know, making sure that you get it all out with a very experienced surgeon. Um, getting it all out the first time really, really matters and that we should consider coming up there for the surgery. And then, you know, we felt very comfortable with our surgeon. Um, and I know he's very, he's a very confident surgeon. He's very experienced. 
Uh, but after this whole deal with the lymph nodes that got left behind and are causing all these complications and stuff now, that's the first time we felt like, man, we should have, we should have gone to MSK for the surgery the first time. So his suggestion was that we continue on to do two more rounds of chemo and immunotherapy here at our home hospital, uh, and that that would give MSK time to really review this stuff in more depth and for their surgeons to evaluate whether or not they feel like they could go in for a third surgery to try to remove these lymph nodes and, and correct this blockage. It's also possible that during that time that that lymph node could respond more to the chemo immunotherapy treatment and it could shrink and correct itself but that's one of those things that we're just going to have to wait and see how this kind of plays out over the next you know four or five weeks. Now you can imagine the pickle we're in at this point. We've got two excellent hospitals giving us two different sort of opinions and based on two very different approaches to treating the same cancer. And that's because uh, our hospital is part of the Children's Oncology Group, which is uh, COG, and MSK is not. They kind of do a little bit of their own thing while hospitals uh, worldwide that are part of the Children's Oncology Group um, kind of all play by the same book, if you will. They are all part of a network. They all communicate uh, amongst one another and that sort of thing, which has its benefits for sure. I think the downside to that is they're not really willing to veer too far off of that path. They kind of have their playbook and it's like we do this and then we do this and then we do this. Uh, MSK, again, kind of does their own thing and tailors treatment very specifically to the individual, it seems like. I'm not an expert when it comes to that, but my general understanding of how these kind of two schools of thought work is, is exactly what I explained. And based on the comment that MSK gave us, you know, initially saying that she doesn't need to be exposed to that level of toxicity with uh, a transplant and, and all that chemo, um, it's just hard for us to really commit at this point to being like, yeah, let's do a transplant, knowing that we still have a lot to learn, that we still need to sort out these couple of pain points. Uh, not to mention, it's been like two months at this point since she got any kind of treatment. So we don't really have a lot of time to sit around and figure it out. Being a high risk MIC-N neuroblastoma stage four, like this cancer could come back and start growing pretty rapidly. So we desperately want to avoid that happening. Once we kind of made up our mind that we didn't want to do transplant and that we wanted to try to do this chemo and immunotherapy treatments, I like, I asked the doctor at MSK, I said, how do I even approach this with our doctors? Like, how do I bring this up and say, we don't want to do what you're suggesting. We want to do something else. And he said, who's your doctor? And he goes, oh, I know her. I'll email her. We'll talk about it and blah, blah, blah. So that was comforting to know um, that they had some, you know, sort of a relationship already and communication in the past and uh, that he would pass along at least the overview of what his suggestion was. And then we ended up following up with a phone call with, with our doctors and let them know, like, we're not really ready to do stem cell transplant. We prefer to do the immunotherapy and that'll buy us the time for MSK and their surgeons to review those results and figure out if they can take care of this surgery or not. And then we'll go from there. The good news is that Kendall is like in a way better position. She's healthier, she's stronger, she's heavier than she's been maybe even since all of this started and when she first got diagnosed. So we think she's gonna do much better through immunotherapy this time around than she did in the first two rounds because you know all the vomiting she was doing and all these issues that we didn't know what was happening and now we know the answer. So we'll be able to feed her through the J-tube, we're gonna hydrate her with IV fluids, uh, and I think she's gonna tolerate it better. I think she's gonna get through it. I think the residual sort of symptoms of all the, the issues with her gut uh, will prevent her from going back to the hospital like she did the last two rounds where we ended up in the hospital just you know 24 hours after being home. So yeah, that is uh, the plan for now.
Brandy and Kendall will go to the hospital on Monday. Uh, I will get there on Wednesday. And um, fingers crossed that everything goes nice and smooth without any hiccups. But that's it. If you guys want to support Kendall and pick up one of her shirts, you can do that just below the video. There'll be some links and you can pick one up for yourself. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. We'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.